Hello everyone, my name is Tan Wei Kyung and I'm a filmmaker from Singapore. Uh, welcome to the Q&A session with the directors from the Southeast Asian Short Film Competition 3. Today we have the pleasure of having with us uh, four directors whose film is in the competition. Uh, so these are the four films. The first one is People on Sunday from Thailand. The director is Tulapop Sanjuron. The second film is To Calm the Pig Inside from Philippines by Joanna Vasquez Arong. The third film is Rocket Ship from Singapore by Matthias Chu. And the fourth film is Terulium Drama from Indonesia by uh, Rial Rizaldi. So I will first go to the, the first film, which is People on Sunday by Tula Pop. Um, it's just a very curious question. I'll, I'll ask it uh, straight away. Um, what is the intention of the one minute free time that's inserted in the film? I think it's a very uh, humorous uh, addition to the film. Tell us about uh, that. Yeah. Uh, I forgot a little bit about it. <laughs> um, um, basically that one minute, uh, um, it wasn't in the first cut. It came after, like, later in the process of editing. Uh, the fact that I want to put that minute, because at first I feel like the, the, the reflection of thinking seriously about free time is not enough in the film. So I want to have uh, something that, like directly reflecting like some, something that directly like reflexive for the audience to start thinking that uh what inside the screen is also imply what outside the screen so it's happening all the time something like that so i kind of see <laughs> that <short. laughs> yeah no 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 i i i, I kind of see that as uh it contributes like to your approach in deconstructing the entire acting, the, the act of filming, which is very interesting to me. And from the description of the film, it is a homage to the 1930 German silent film of the same title. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously it has a lot of uh, influence to you. Do you want to talk about how that film influenced you in, mm -hmm. in directly or any subtle ways? So the, the idea of making film about free time on screen is actually came from uh, my writing when I was in school and I was writing something about free time in like in the new liberal age. Uh, and I was, and I was trying to question myself, like how can I make a film about free time? And then I thought about this film because when I watched the, the original People on Sunday version is, is the, how can I say, like, I always have like this two layers of watching that film all the time. Because the, 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 the initial concept of that film is that they have this uh, non-actor acting in the day off. And I find that uh paradox is quite interesting so so that's why i wanted to make a film about it uh and directly referring to that film because i i just found that it's quite interesting material to 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 remake yeah because because it's not about the story itself but it's it's about what is being presented in, 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 the, uh, in the screen. So I'm trying to recreate that second layer while I was watching that film, basically. And I also noticed like that's uh, kind of, maybe it's your approach that kind of uh, insert a, a form of humor Mm -hmm. uh, that the audience kind of recognizes when they are watching your film. Oh, I'm watching it. You, I'm watching you filming someone who's just 
using their free time on a on a lazy Sunday. Is this uh, bizarreness or this subtle form of uh, humor something that you intended from the very beginning, or did it just form in the production with your crew or and and the editing stage? Is it a very free form kind of production? <clears throat> Well, not really. I mean, everything is quite scripted beforehand, and and but it's not like a detail scripted. Uh, I just know what kind of shot I want, what kind of thing I want people to do behind the scene as well. So, so basically, make the whole production becoming the film. Uh, uh, so, so it. So it's like half half, I think. It's kind of half free form, but half not. Yeah. Um, and the humor aspect, for me, I never thought about humor when I was writing. Uh, but I kind of know that it's going to happen because I think humor is something that's very close to stress and insanity is like very blur line between like uh, sanity and insanity and and it's something re really vulnerable and sensitive so I because of these kind of subject matter for me is really vulnerable to talk about uh, yeah yeah I mean I, mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just too sensitive about, you know, free time, but I think it's kind of killing me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tula Pop. Um, let's move on to the next film, To Calm the Pig Inside by Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Hello. Hi. Thanks for uh, coming on to the interview with us. So, um, To Calm the Pig Inside is a documentation of sorts that detail the very devastating um, impact of Typhoon Yolanda in 2013. And we see a lot of parallel simil similarities with the current COVID pandemic and how we see how people cope with trauma in a country that's further crippled by like mismanagement of the leaders. So is was this film done with uh, the current COVID pandemic in the background? Um, actually, no, but the film, when, when I first thought of this film, actually right before Yolanda happened, there was an um, earthquake that had happened um, in the Visayas as well, just three weeks prior. And I decided, and that's where the name of the film actually comes from. I decided to volunteer partly because of what I had read, you know, all this corruption going on with um, the politicization of, of aid. Mayors weren't allow, allowing people to come in, but they had to get certain permits. And I actually was thinking of doing a film on that. And in fact, I did end up doing a film on this. And then Yolanda happened. And so this is what I, I recounted in, in, in the film. Like, I didn't think it could get worse, more worse than what happened with the earthquake. And here go, we go again. And eventually I had started um, a scholarship initiative. So it was based in Tacloban, but as well where the typhoon first, first made landfall in another province uh, called Samar. And again, all these different stories came up. So I had originally wanted to make three films partly to show how this is just an unending cycle. Um, so I was trying to put the three films together, two word narrative, and then there was this um, documentary. What had happened in Dakloban, I mean, it was just much stronger to tell the people's stories I thought that I had heard. But somehow, you know, I, I, I really wanted to put it out there with the three films together, but it just honestly didn't work. And in the end, it's, it's actually much stronger on its own. And I realize it, touch, it seems to be touching more people. It's become a little bit more universal. So it wasn't really my intention for it to come out this year. It's just so happened to come out this year. And yeah, it's just a little bit 
surreal when, for example, when we premiered it in the Philippines, we were just in the middle of um, another controversy, you know, with all this money disappearing with the health insurance and, and millions, billions uh, m missing. It's just gone. We don't know where it is. And just in the last few weeks, again, we had these typhoons and parts of the country are still flooded. It's just the same thing. So um, in terms of your question, no, it wasn't my intention, but what has, what has um, emerged is what's consistent is the same kind of problems seem to be arising. Number one, um, first, there's the natural calamity. People are, are devastated by that. But I think the bigger calamity is actually how it's kind of mishandled. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about you noticing these cycles that keeps repeating. Does this disaster happening and the response that, uh, or the lack of response that the victims have to endure and some somehow kind of survive on their own. Do you see your films as more observational, like it is beyond our control, or do you hope to push people to have action? How, how do you see your film in the, the bigger picture? That's a really good question, because I don't really see myself as an activist per se, but the more that I've been talking about this film, um, uh, I don't want to say ironically, but somehow subconsciously, I think what had happened was I just kept hearing these stories that I felt weren't being shared. Instead, we we're hearing about statistics, etc. So I felt like I really just wanted to, I don't want to say give a voice because that sounds so for, for lack of a better word, I just wanted to share stories that people hadn't heard. And I feel even though this film was about um, Takloban, I, I feel there, there could be stories of similar stories that I'd heard in, in, in Bohol where the earthquake had happened or in Samar where the um, typhoon first made landfall back in 2013. And again, the stories that I'm hearing um, with the flooding. So I suppose I'm, hoping I'm, yeah, I guess it is that. I, I'm hoping to give a bit of a voice for those that aren't being featured, I suppose. These are not just statistics, but these are people that are suffering twice. Yeah. And um, I saw in your other interviews, um, you describing the process of this film, um, could you tell us how the footages were gathered for this, um, this film itself? Yeah, so, um, in the, so when I first actually went to Takloban, I was uh, working on another um, foreign production. So through that process, we went, you know, weeks after the typhoon, I had met some storm chasers who were also giving advice on where to film, et cetera, and we became friends. Again, at the time, I had no intention really to make a film. I didn't realize I was going to make a film, but through the years having met students and, and, and teachers, eventually I said, okay, I need to make a film. But also when we were scouting for places to shoot, we also shot some footage just to show, you know, um, is this something that you'd like to film or whatnot? But they were more focused on I was more focused on the people. They were more focused on the actual destruction on nature as well as on the buildings. Um, so yeah, partly in terms of the live footage, um, we had friends who were actually there during Yolanda. One had to be airlifted out. Um, so those are live footage during the typhoon that I got. Um, there were photojournalists that I had also met that had spent weeks at least three weeks living off um, canned goods or whatnot. Um, again, when they heard about my film, they were more than willing to collaborate as well. Um, and in terms of the drawings, those were made by our students, basically. Um, instead of asking them, you know, what happened? What did you go through? I just, we voluntarily asked them, do you want to draw what happened during Yolanda? And so they drew it, and some of them volunteered to tell me what was in the drawing, basically. 
and yeah so in a way when they repeated those stories to me it was very much still alive for them so that's why when you watch the film that's we decided to keep that part um, colored Thank you so much, Joanna. I think there's a lot of uh, pain and hurt that comes through layers in your film, and I really enjoy watching it. So thank you for this valuable insight. Thank you. Um, and we'll move on to the third film in the lined up, uh, Rocket Ship from Matthias Chu. Hi, Matthias. Hi. Hello. So this is your graduation film at NTU ADM if I'm not wrong. So um, it's, it's a graduation film this year, right, Matthias? Uh, yes. So why, why did you decide to tell um, this story of a neglected child, especially from a single parent family unit? Um, I think like for the film, uh, it was a kind of personal story. It was inspired by uh, personal events. Um, that occurred um, when I was in Polytechnic, which led to my parents' separation for a couple of months. So this whole entire process um, really taught me um, how to adapt and to accept things uh, that were beyond my control, um, which was something that I felt that many others uh, whose parents have or are separated would struggle with. Um, and so with that in mind, that, that was kind of the genesis for the narrative. But of course, like for the film, it kind of evolved and grew uh, into something much more with my team's input. Uh, yeah, and I'm just grateful that I managed to be able to tell my story with the sort of support of people around me. Yeah. Thanks for sharing the story with us. And are there, especially with such a personal and sensitive uh, matter that's so close to your personal life, are there any difficulties in working with such a complex topic, um, how long is that process? If you could tell us a bit about it. I think the was that kind of balance that I needed to kind of handle when approaching uh, the story as well. Because um, on one hand, it's like, I want to tell my story. But on the other hand, it's like, I don't, I also want it to be accessible um, for the audience as well. So it's kind of trying to balance out the two. Um, and I think in my development process is, so it started off with um, my own experiences, but I think it's like true talking to many others, friends and family who have gone through the, the struggles. I kind of took in uh, parts and pieces from everyone and that kind of form the bigger narrative and kind of structure the film in that way. So when I was writing the questions, um, I, I didn't realize that this is coming from your personal uh, memory and history. So the, the last question that I was thinking of asking, if it's too sensitive, you don't have to answer it. Um, so do you think the, the adult characters, especially the father in your film, I'm talking about the story, do you think they are uh, aware or are they guilty of the pain that they are causing the sun? I think when I wrote it, definitely, um, I think they do know and they are in, uh, in a certain level, they, they are aware of what they're putting the other families through, the other family members through. But um, I think it uh, has all to do with like perspective. So with this film, um, we're looking at, at, look, we're looking at through the lens of this boy. Um, so we kind of um, understand his side of the story. Um, and, you know, in the film, some, some audience members might find that, you know, the dad might be the one that is like, um, like the antagonist in a sense. Um, but I think when we take a step back and we look at it from a whole, it's like everyone has their own story to tell. And I think um, if we actually follow, you know, the father's character, we might actually understand and kind of empathize like his decisions and his choices. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. Uh, thanks, Matthias, uh, for sharing this film with us. So we will move on to the last film in the program. It's titled Terulium Drama from Indonesia by Rial Rizaldi. Hi, Rial. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. So, hi. I, I'm really curious about this uh, film. It's, it's a, it's a, so in, in your film, the word uh, geophysics is a term that's mentioned many, many times in, in this short film. What does it exactly mean and, and why are you invested in that as, a, as an artist, actually? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually coming from the idea of mountain because the starting point of this project is I'm thinking a lot about the relation between human and nature and then how human sees technology as some kind of like culture instead of nature. So uh, yeah, and then start, and the other starting point is this uh, radio station uh, built by the Dutch colonial in the 20s when they actually use the mountain as a, as an antenna. So that's where the idea of geophysics comes a lot in this, in this films, because the, in the end, it, it was, uh, there's no clear distinction between nature and technology kind of thing. Like, because even the, the Dutch scientists, the Dutch colonialists are also using nature, nature as to, you know, uh, uh, sending the waves, the radio waves uh, to, to the mainland Europe. So yeah, so there's where the idea of geo and geophysics comes. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, information and research that we have to grapple with in the film. Like we see in the film, this kind of invisible tension between the community of the native people who actually who have already left the land it's it's the the uh, descendant of the communities that's left and they have to struggle with the politics and the geophysics that kind of shapes the island so can you share with us like how did you uh, what is your research process in gathering all this information and uh, kind of piecing them out in the film that that we eventually saw in the program yeah so well i guess uh at first i was really interested well i'm, I'm a big fan of radio and then the whole history about radio as, uh, as well so when i was in my my mother's home in bandung in indonesia it's very close to the radio station uh, the 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 ruins of that radio station so but i never know about that history uh, the history of that radio station so I try to dig the history, but mostly mo most of the history, like you know, official history, was written by the Dutch colonialists, and there's like a lot of actual uh, kind of like you know minor history that basically comes from the community or the indigenous people around that area. So the 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 official history is always like you know this is like a big Dutch project uh, to kind of like uh, creating a radio station, a first wireless radio station in the Asia, and you know, all of this kind of like really heroic colonial stuff. But there's also like the other stories, which is like the, just the people around that, uh, around that area, uh, and mostly also the, the, the labor, the one who built the, the, the radio station. So I try to talk a lot with this people who are actually already moved, but uh, some, of the, some of the descendants are still you know, two kilometers or two, three kilometers around that area. So, yeah, and then in this film, I try to kind of like mix all of this uh, uh, rigorous method of research, you know, like archive and stuff like that with kind of like personal history, almost fictional, actually, because we cannot like guarantee what, what's actually, uh, uh, what is this people actually said it's true or not, but it's really interesting. And then, as well, uh, you know, this kind, these people also have the different kind of like cosmologies, like how they think about nature, how they think about their relationship with other human. So I think this kind of like uh, collision between you know official history that are you know you you have to dig the the archive and then also like this more personal and more almost like superstitious in one way, uh, 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 mix all together in this film. And you mentioned how it we don't really know what is real, what is like true and what is fic 
fi uh, fictional. And, and that is especially tr true towards the end where we see a musician playing a beautiful song at the end. Uh, could you tell us your intention in putting that in the end? Yeah, I mean, I'm always interested in this kind of like, uh, I guess, like the philosophical questions of, you know, polarity, what is true, what it's not. And to most of my works are kind of like always, you know, mixing all of this together, uh, factual and non-factual. And then this, this musician, he's, he's practically, he's not really a musician. He's more kind of like, uh, uh, how do I say it? Like shaman. So, but he, he, he performed this kind of like offering, uh, uh, with with music and this kind of like offering is actually the the way that people back then try a uh, 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 a mode of communication with the mountain. So um, my my decision to put it in the end is just like kind of like showing how how this idea of uh, communication and and you know uh, 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 yeah like like how human and 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 mountains communicate are actually mediated. Uh, using this kind of like creative or more kind of like artistic approach, which is music, and and that's this is this that's also like the reason why I don't you know put subtitles when he was actually recite, reciting this kind of like offerings and, and and yeah basically just try to communicate with with the mountains and with the ancestor. I found it like really interesting to 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 collaborate with this person. His name is Iman Jinbot, and and he was um. He was actually a good friend of mine, but uh, we we always try to find an opportunity to work together. And I guess since he was also like quite related to that to that area, uh, he he wants to do it. So yeah, so in the end, I was just like, yeah, yeah, let's let's do it. And also, it's uh, this project uh, was not scripted at all. So basically, like all, all of I just shoot a lot around that area, and then when I edit it, and I start to write the write the, the narration and stuff like that. And the, uh, that's a very interesting um, uh, knowledge, like you, you telling us how, how you formed the film in the end. Um, did, did that take a long time? Like, how do you know when your information is enough to, to make a film as a, as a director? Yeah, I think when I edit as uh uh when I edit uh the films, I think uh, I had this kind of like standard. It's enough when I kind of like understand what I want to say. But uh, quite often it was so confusing and too too complex. And then if it's too complex, even for me, I'm just gonna stop. But uh, yeah, but uh, my standard is just like as long as I I. I I kind of like understand what's the what's the idea behind the films and yeah and then the other the other the other part is like because I'm not coming from you know filmmaking background and and quite often my work are showing not in the black box condition so in 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 terms of like showing at a museum or in a gallery then people could like spend so much time to understand the the, 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 all the research and then all of the materials that are presented in the in the films, but uh, I I also you know, understand the constraint when you have to just sit uh, sit for twenty six minutes watching these films in like one uh, one run and then there's so much information uh, uh, just disappear. But yeah yeah I think that's kind of like my standard. And also the other thing is just like I really like to 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 find my audience basically sleeping. In, in when the, when they watch my films, because uh, maybe as Satula Pop was also saying, I, I'm really I, I like this idea of non-productivity and cinema. I think is like the escape for that non-productive uh, force, and then you just like sit down and then watch the films. And if it's too confusing, then you're just sleeping. That's good for me. Thank you so much for such a humorous uh, insight, Ariel, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, at this session. I've learned a lot, a, a great lot about uh, your film today. So thank you very much to the four directors. Uh, their films are showing in the Southeast Asian Short Film Competition 3 at the Singapore International Film Festival. So do remember to catch them.